Hello, lovely lounge lizards, and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the origins and source of biohacking itself. Now, what is biohacking? Let's take a deeper look. When we hear Tim Ferriss talk about his time in Japan with his year abroad, he talks about, uh, well, hey, this poor tea is pretty good stuff. And then Dave Asprey is talking about, you know, people in Nepal and Tibet put butter in their tea. And I thought to myself, they're really repackaging a lot of stuff that every Chinese grandmother knows. And I thought, well, I grew up with a Chinese stepdad. I lived in China. I am a doctor of Chinese medicine, grew up doing Chinese martial arts. I think there may be a little more to biohacking than the last five to 10 years. In fact, I'm pretty sure this goes way back. Recently, I was in Pengzhou, and this is said to be the place where Pengzhou lived. And he is the original biohacker, or at least he created the nourishing life method, which is used throughout China, throughout East Asia. It's the basis of Qigong, a lot of exercises in Tai Chi, a lot of the diet therapy is attributed to him as well as Taoist sexual practices. So Peng Zhu was the original biohacker, or at least the first one we have in history. And history is an iffy word because it gets a little bit mythical. However, when it comes to Chinese legends, I've learned to hold a space between belief and disbelief. And this is because in Sichuan, I've heard that certain areas around Qingcheng Shan, uh, Qingcheng Mountain, have dragons. Then I later found that there were caves with poisonous gas and that there were areas with deadly snakes. By the ancient way of figuring it, super serpents have been upgraded into dragons. Also, along the Heilongtan region, this is kind of um, river system around Renshou in Sichuan, there's a lake that's said to have dragons. And I know this because I said to my friend, hey, this is beautiful, we should go swimming. And he said, no, 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 there are dragons here. Now, naturally, modern people consider this to be superstition. At least they did until a fisherman was in his boat with his dog. The dog went overboard. As the dog was swimming toward the fisherman, the dog was eaten, swallowed up in a gulp. It turns out that they have old catfish in these lakes the size of cars. Now, I'm not saying that deadly snakes and catfish, which could eat a child, are dragons, but practically speaking, they qualify as being close enough. So as I go through Peng Zhu's life story, I'll add some comments here based on cultural context I received from folks who currently live in his old stomping grounds in Sichuan. Today in Peng Zhou, Sichuan, there's a giant statue of him Surrounding his statue are plaques of long-lived people from Brazil to France to Australia, many of whom are indigenous people who used botanical medicine to enhance their longevity. They are all like Peng Zhu and respected for their knowledge and wisdom. According to Taoist writer Ge Hong, who lived 283 in the Common Era, Peng Zhu was said to be the great-great-grandson of Emperor Zhuan Shu. When he was three, his mother died. Then he encountered the Chuan Rong Rebellion. He wandered homeless and miserable and had no father. He had buried 49 wives, 54 sons, and met incredible hardships. His health from stress had been damaged severely and caused blockages which aged him. Eventually, he stopped letting tragedy get to him and started nourishing life practices, which today would be called biohacking in the West or yangsheng in China. Apparently they worked because by the end of the yin era, he was said to be 760 years old and it was said that he hadn't aged. He was fond of peace and tranquility and had no concern for earthly affairs. He had no concern for reputation. Wait, hold up. 760 years? This is the space between belief and disbelief. All right, maybe, just maybe, and I realize I'm being a bit of an apologist here, by cycles or by years, they meant just kind of a general cycle. 
because I believe that he could easily look strong. Uh, maybe he looked really fit and looked young at 760 months. That would make him over a little bit over 63 years old. Maybe it wasn't exactly agreed upon back in the day that we were counting years. Methuselah in the Old Testament was said to have lived to 969. If we were counting months, that would make him 80 years old, which I'm sure seemed like forever when the average life expectancy was 30. I'm not saying these guys were liars or the people around them were, but I just find it more plausible that they were counting months instead of years. At the same time, I'll take the possibility that I'm being narrow-minded and just viewing history through the lens that I can understand myself. In any case, it doesn't really matter if he was that old or not. I have to ground his advice in the reality of what we're currently living in and surrounded with today and compare his teachings with people who live a long time today. In the United States, we have Southern black ladies who live to 120 years old after having grown up with some serious oppression. They smoke cigars and drink whiskey. So these aren't uh, textbook longevity practices, and yet there seems to be something genetically or about a uh, life path that they've chosen. I try to see what famed people like Peng Zhu and modern centenarians have in common. Peng Zhu is rad and worth learning from, but I think we should also pay attention to my preferred image of longevity, who is someone like Susanna Jones or Rebecca Lanyard. They lived to 115 and 119, and their parents were slaves. I don't mean that they had a few options in life and they worked at a factory. I mean like backscarred actual slaves. If anyone had their share of trauma and intergenerational trauma, it's these feisty American black women who just won't quit. They're like the Energizer bunnies. And they learn not to let life bother them. And they turned with the seasons all while apparently enjoying cigars and booze as part of their longevity practices they gardened. They ate a plant-based diet, semi-wild vegetables, greens, and learned early on that life wasn't fair but not to let it get to you. And I think this is an important thing that Peng Zhu and these more recent women like Susanna and Rebecca can teach us is that life isn't fair. The longer you believe that it is, and then you get the wake-up call, you may be in college and then you're protesting and angry and the news is bothering you. I think there's something to just growing up having the government trying to kill you or kill your people, as was the case with Peng Zhu and these women. They just don't, they don't let it get to them. They have a resilience that maybe people who are more bought into the illusion of uh, government as community are more susceptible to. And this is somewhat of a poisonous trap people get stuck in. There's a belief among people who have bought into the idea of a participatory government that if they don't get all of their friends to vote the same way, that life will become uh, either hell or if they can get everybody to vote the way that they want, it'll become paradise on earth. For Peng Zhu, Susanna Jones, and Rebecca Lanier, the government wasn't something they put much stock in. Neither they, neither they nor Peng Zhu thought that getting angry was going to change the government or that it was worth arguing with your family about. They placed a high value on their families and communities and gardens. These were the politics of their house, their inner circle, their circle of actual influence. And that was where their intent stayed. Their value systems were set this way based on early childhood experiences. As distant as Southern black women born to slave parents may seem from Peng Zhu, they actually share more similarities than you might think. They live simply. It's said that Peng Zhu didn't adorn his clothing or carriage and spent all his money on good food and herbs. Susanna Jones and Rebecca Lanier also grew up on farms and gardened their own food. It also seems that they weren't especially fond of the government and preferred self-sufficiency. They were more about personal comfort than flash and were deeply rooted in their communities. Perhaps it was growing up with the rebellion and becoming homeless as a child, but Peng Zhu wasn't a big fan of government. The King of Yin asked Peng Zhu to become a government official. 
he figured that anyone who can master balancing the energies of his body to this extent could be a great asset to the kingdom. Peng Zhu didn't care, though. He said that he was sick and faked a cough and went back to his village. He liked maintaining his habits and exercising. Peng was really good at making herbal tonics, and he was a superstar at breathwork. It was said that he liked kasha, which is a kind of cinnamon, which can regulate blood sugar and adrenal response. He also liked powdered mica, which is used for phlegm, mucus accumulation in the body, and water retention, and is protective to the central nervous system. He was also fond of pine nuts and elk antler because he had a lot of wives to keep harmonious. He had a youthful countenance, basically the opposite of children you see from pictures in the 1930s where everyone looks 50 no matter what their age. Peng Tzu was also said to be a solemn guy. He never claimed to have attained the Tao or enlightenment and wasn't fond of incantations or ghosts. And I think this is a good sign. A lot of Taoist guys are kind of weirdos you would expect to be on some sort of FBI list. Thankfully, Peng Zhu turned, you know, everyone in the village seemed to think he was a pretty nice guy. He wasn't some sort of creepy wizard lurking around in parks. He was pretty chill and enjoyed traveling. He had a horse and carriage, but really liked walking instead. I guess he needed to get his uh, 30,000 steps in a day. He would take off for months without provisions. When he got back, he was not ravenous or deteriorated. How did he do this? Personally, I think he stole chickens. I know I'm not supposed to point my fingers at a god of longevity, but how else do you explain him happily roaming around with no money? I submit that Peng Zhu went on nocturnal ninja missions to steal vegetables and chickens. It wasn't like they had credit cards back in the day. People carried belts of money when they had coins, but in Peng Zhu's day, they were probably still using golden ingots. You can't really keep those well in your pockets. If you tried to run, they would slam about. You know, just ask any man who has tried jogging in sweatpants with keys in his pocket why this is a bad idea. Maybe he just had really good social credit and people were happy to see him and he paid him back later. I don't know. I think, though, personally, that the simplest explanation is the best and he was likely snatching up chickens when no one was looking. He did breath holding practice daily from morning until noon during the most yang part of the day. And this breath work makes use of intermittent hypoxia to increase nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is an important vasodilator and gasotransmitter, so it can help regulate your body's hormones and nervous system. It serves as a stand-in for oxygen. And after this, he would hyper-oxygenate his body. It was a lot like using a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. He would follow this by rubbing his eyes to help increase circulation around the eye, to prevent inflammation from building up, leading to cataracts and damage to the optic nerve. He would then practice salivary cultivation. What is this? It's gathering saliva. Well, first of all, it's very good for oral health. The saliva will destroy many pathogenic bacteria, which contribute to tooth decay. Secondly, saliva has amylase, which is an important enzyme. Also, saliva helps to regulate gut microbiota. And saliva is decreased with stress and increases with a parasympathetic response, which you get through meditation or sleep. So the more relaxed you are, especially while waking, the more saliva builds up. And this is really important for your healing response. Saliva practice is important today in Chinese longevity practices, just as it was in Peng Zhu's time. To begin with salivary practice, just run your tongue along the teeth and the inside of your mouth, especially along the roof of your mouth. This stimulates cranial nerves. You can often kind of feel a little bit of a zing as you do this, and this really stimulates salivary production. So let your mouth fill up and use it as a mouthwash. Use your tongue to massage your gums and teeth. Some practices say do it 36 times rotations or clean your teeth 36 uh, times going clockwise and then counterclockwise. I'm not convinced that it matters so much, at least at first, but aim for doing this in the morning and then swallowing the saliva at once. Try this uh, three times in the morning. It's very effective. I like doing this in conjunction with an enzyme mix from Bioptimizer. 
the combination gives me metabolism that I really don't deserve. It's a great way to kickstart a sluggish body. After salivary practice, Peng Zhu would massage his body. Self-massage is something most of us don't take seriously enough until we're injured, but this is a great way to prevent injury. There are five main massage techniques that I'll outline. So for you massage therapists, pay especially close attention, but for all of us, this is good. The first is beating. You'll see Chinese people beating themselves in public parks all over the world. This is for the immune system. This is for lymphatic flow and a traditional concept called wind and eliminating wind. The idea with this is that there are bugs or microorganisms that come on the wind and make you achy. It turns out that this is true and this is why osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are very dependent on changes in the immune system, which is why different weather changes can influence the body and spike or decrease pain. Light beating with a fist or cupped hand is similar to the beating with birch branches that you see after saunas in Finland and Slavic countries. It's also similar to cupping or gua sha scraping practices, which brings circulation to the surface of the skin. This is somewhat simulating a febrile response to protect the body by bringing blood and white blood cells to the surface to fight invaders. Once the pathogens get in deeper, your body will create a more generalized immune response, which creates pain and fatigue. So the more balanced and more powerful your immune system is, the more specific rather than generalized it can be, and the more laser targeted it can be at getting rid of those pathogens without stealing your energy and spiking pain. As silly as it may look to beat yourself, this practice is great for you. As you begin beating, you go down the channel and afterwards you immediately wipe with your palm to smooth out the channels to make sure that you aren't creating any additional blockages or bruises. This practice relates to the metal phase, which is also considered to be wind and relates to the lungs and large intestine. The next phase is pressing. Pressing with weight is said to be good for the bones. Pressing and moving blood is thought to be good for blood circulation. This is likely influencing piezoelectricity, which literally means pressure electricity. This is stimulated when your bones experience pressure and it's a way that your body signals bone remodeling and tissue repair. As blood circulation comes near, it creates an electric charge, which is an aspect of qi and the gasoelectric systems of the body. This relates to the water element and the kidney and urinary bladder. Shaking or trembling is extremely good for liver qi, which becomes tight with stress and tension. This causes a lot of muscle tension. You especially see this in the shoulders and around the hips. Clayton Shu, who is by my estimation, one of the best acupuncturists in the US, recommended to me that I get the hypervolt massager, which is like a jackhammer. It's around 300 bucks and I have to admit, I was a bit hesitant at first because how much better could this be than a $35 massager? But after I bought it, I have to say that if you plan on using it even once every few days, it is very worth it. It can get to very deep tissue working out adhesions, which can greatly enhance your quality of life. Standing in one place and shaking your body is another good way to loosen up. You see dance with shaking and moving freely from West African healing traditions to churches in the U.S. Especially if this were to be combined with prayer or changes in mental states, I can see this as a life cultivation practice, which is undoubtedly the way that people will shake loose pain and injury held in place by mental tension. And this phase belongs to wood. Actually, I've got kind of a funny story about this. A friend of mine is from Oaxaca in Mexico, and Oaxaca is known to have a very large indigenous population. So there's a man from Mexico City, and he was in a car accident. He was basically bent in half and using a cane, even though he was under 40 years old. So he gets to the village, and the healer guy looks him over, you know, uh, does a lot of palpation, asks about the history, says, okay, for you, I've got something very special. And he brings the, um, uh, God, how do I translate this? Uh, basically, so I, I heard this in Spanish and the, basically the village idiot uh, was brought over 
and the village idiot who was strong of arm placed a bucket on the guy's lower back and the healer guy got a baseball bat and said, okay, okay, just, just stand there. This is going to be great. On three, I'm going to hit it and set your back. So he counts one, two, and on three, the guy just lurches up and screams. And suddenly he's standing up and the healer said, you know, actually it wasn't your spine that was keeping you bent over. It wasn't your muscles that were keeping you bent over. It was your mind. It was the mental tension that was locking you in place. So this particular therapy utilized an equal amount of fear as that which he experienced during the car collision in order to reset or scare him into moving in the opposite direction. I'm not saying this is a preferred method, but it is kind of funny to hear about. Anyway, the next phase is fire, and it relates to the heart and circulation. For this, you use point pressing. You can use an acupressure device, or you can simply grasp your knuckle with your thumb to make a phoenix eye fist. Using lots of point pressing can really heat up your body, and I think this is one of the reasons why it relates to fire. I think it's stimulating a bit of an inflammatory response. The final phase is earth, which is kneading and circling. It's mostly squeezing, and most of us are familiar with this type of massage. In Chinese Tui Na massage, this is typically done by rolling the edge of your hand back and forth with your palm. You can use a rolling pin to get the same effect. It's possible that foam rollers are used the same way. So with your hand, you basically take the edge of your hand and then roll to your palm along the knuckles keeping your hand relaxed and using the weight of your arm and your body so that you can get this rolling effect. So Peng Tzu would go through and do self-massage using these types of methods. He would then do Dao Yin, which is basically Taoist yoga. So Peng Tzu was really into self-care. He's basically an Instagram yoga chick with out the Lululemon pants and Wi-Fi. If he had pain or fatigue, he would do yogic Tao Yin exercises to get rid of it. As we all get older, strange pains come from various sources. Each type of pain can stem from different causes. This gets labeled as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. Peng Zhu had his share of this and did self-care exercises to alleviate it. So he was not only the first biohacker, he was also fibrohacking to reduce chronic pain. If you know someone with fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivity, or chronic fatigue, then let them know about fibrohacking.com. It's a protocol I developed, which I taught to around 60 medical practitioners. 40 of them put their minds together to create fibrohacking. And now people from all over the world find life-changing relief through this program. This is really great because I taught the information and people who have learned from me, my students, took it even further by putting their heads together and uh, finding what they all had in common, sharing their case studies. This is a really beautiful example of positive collaboration. One of the key concepts from the fibro hacking program toward the end of it, around stage four, is for alleviating stabbing pain. Now we don't start with this exercise because if you do this one first, it actually increases the problems associated with fibromyalgia in that you're allowing latent pathogens to spread. But once those pathogens have been cleared away, the immune system is alleviated um, from its burdens, it's feeling strong, the gut's doing well, you've worked with psychogenic factors involving pain, then it's time to go deeper. And you alleviate this stabbing pain by working with gamma wave, brainwave frequencies. And you do this while feeling the pulse throughout your body. And this comes straight from practices which have been attributed to Peng Zhu. He would practice until he felt his pulse and chi in his fingertips and toes. This is phenomenal for increasing microcirculation and it alleviates many types of pain. Again, it's just important to make sure that you have done immune system work, lymphatic work, to make sure that any potential pathogens aren't being driven in deeper. The order of these exercises and the timing of them was just as important to Peng Zhu 
as the exercises themselves. This ability to self-heal and maximize his body and brain brought him a lot of attention simply because he helped a lot of people along the way. So the King of Yin gave up on summoning him to be an official and instead asked Peng Zhu to teach him about the Tao. And Peng Zhu said he didn't know. He just liked to exercise in a bit. So the king sent gifts to show respect. Peng Zhu used these gifts to help feed people in his village. Because he's no fool, you need community health, and there were people in need, so why not make use of those gifts? So the king thought, I'm not going to get a direct answer. This guy clearly doesn't respect me. But he had a Taoist concubine who was 270 years old, but looked 15. So he offered to introduce them to each other. Peng Zhu thought she was rad, so they got to talking. The courtesan bowed twice and asked about longevity. Peng Zhu said that if you want to ascend to heaven, those who go to the palace of the immortals use gold and cinnabar. Okay, hold up. Gold and cinnabar? Well, first of all, these are symbols. They can mean a lot of different concepts uh, from planets to spiritual states to organ systems and possibly all of these in a kind of holographic sense, fractal sense. In this case, I will assume he's referring more to the different aspects of our unchanging immortal spirits. The gold and cinnabar are often used to refer to the heart and the kidneys. Then he said that this is something that kings and lords can't do, which kind of reinforces the transcendent quality. Then he says, secondly, love your essence and cultivate your spirit and take medicinal food. This is basically a slightly more tangible understanding of what he had just said before. But then he adds that if they don't understand the connections of all things in the universe, even medicine won't help them. Oh, that's kind of interesting. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling disconnections with between yourself and the universe, then the disconnections will be happening internally as well. So that's uh, very easy to say and a lot harder to realize at any sort of visceral level. But apparently it's possible. He then told her that if she could cultivate yin and yang, then she wouldn't even need the concept of separation itself. So that once she could really understand yin and yang, then talking about yin and yang was useless and could be harmful. Now, this is an idea that is found throughout a lot of longevity practices today. And that's the idea that thinking about the chi will harm the chi. Thinking about the spirit harms the spirit. If you try to manually control yin and yang, it's not as good as just kind of taking yourself out of the equation using those as general guidelines, but not being too serious about it. Because if you try to over control it, then it leads to more imbalance. So you kind of ballpark it one way or the other. It's kind of like steering a boat. You don't want to oversteer. You just make gentle corrections. So Peng Zhu told her that he'd heard about a true master in the mountains of Dayuan, who was a thousand years old with the complexion of a child who walked 300 miles a day and could go a year without eating. And yet if he wanted to, he could eat nine meals a day and said, look, if you really want to know how this stuff works, you should go talk to him. So the courtesan asked Peng Zhu, is this guy a Taoist immortal? So Peng Zhu said, no, no, no. He's just linked up with the Tao, but he's no immortal. Immortals ride birds and dragons and clouds. They eat mushrooms, herbs, and go in and out of the human world. They don't have human emotions. They have lost their original nature for a different one. Okay. So it sounds like uh, immortals are cyborgs. Maybe they're half robot. I'm not sure. I haven't attained that level. And it sounds like if I did, I wouldn't really be much of me anyway, which is probably a good thing. Um, anyway, aside over. So Peng Zhu said that the way of humans is that they should be able to eat amazing food, wear nice clothing, understand yin and yang without messing with them too much, and establish balance in business and society. Have acute ears and eyes, strong bones, and bright complexions. 
We should be able to age without weakening, live long, and become resilient to cold, heat, wind, damp, and ghosts, and other supernatural beings. We should be free from the ill effects of joy and slander and fame. And if people just chill and don't care so much, then even without the arts of longevity, they can reach the age of 120 years old, presumably with a cigar and a glass of whiskey. But he said if they can't do this, it's because of self-harm and because of indulgence in emotional fluctuations and not respecting vitality. So he says to her, if someone like you has returned somewhat to the Tao and can be 240, then with a little knowledge, you can reach 480. Those who fully use their harmonious etiquette can extend life, but not become immortals. Understanding yin and yang, to stay warm in winter and cool in summer without losing harmony, is to adjust the body. Not being a horn dog and chasing after sexy people is not to be confused by desire and allows the spirit to pass through oneself freely. To have clothing and cars which give you dignity is enough to feel content. He said, look, play some music, see some colors, enjoy sight and sound as a guide to bring the heart and thoughts back to tranquility. This is how you live an awesome life. So today in Sichuan, in China, there are still modern cavemen. I've met many around Qingcheng Mountain. They're masters of systems that will die with them. Their friends vaguely know about their whereabouts. If you ask them, where is he? They might say, oh, around this time of year, he's about 30 kilometers that way. He should be foraging for Shanyao, Radix discoria, which is an herb that increases hormonal precursors called DHEAs. So these people still exist. There are still hermits and adepts who are just off in the forest. And if you want to talk to them, you better speak fluent hillbilly because the thickness of their hillbilly accents are, it's so thick, it's like the deepest Appalachian, unintelligible hillbilly speak you could possibly imagine. And even people who are Sichuanese who grew up in the city can't understand them. It takes me about a week of hanging out with people in that area to where I can get it, and then I can start to talk with them. But then when I come back into the city, everyone laughs at me. But that's the adjustment you need to make if you want to meet Taoist uh, adepts who are chewing on roots. So I met other adepts, such as a Kung Fu master who grew up near Wudang. He handled an 80-pound training sword like it was a butter knife with incredible tensegrity. And I said, wow, you, know, you, should be, you should be teaching. And he kind of scoffed. He said he didn't care in the least to teach anyone besides his bodyguards. He used his knowledge of the Tao for business and real estate, and he amassed a fortune in the process. In using this, he was able to create the changes he wanted to see to uplift his family, his clan, and his home village. His investments helped to pull countless people out of poverty. So he asked me, what was this compared to punching somebody in the neck? He could already do that, but if he could really employ the Tao, then he could use it for bigger projects. He was regarded as a knight within the Sichuan Martial Arts Society there, which I was a part of. He worked with a single-minded dedication to alleviating suffering for as many people as he could. So many people talk about the Tao, but they end up doing nothing. And they seem to think that this is the same as Wu Wei or non-doing. Actually, they're just useless. And it's not the uselessness that's praised in Taoism. It's just that they're incapable. And this is because the medicine his people needed was sustenance, and he was able to provide it. Like Peng Zhu, he and the others who became my business mentors and um, mentors for nourishing longevity practices, were very adamant about sexual control. 100 days of abstinence is a common method in Chinese longevity practices to help restore the essence of the body. Now, from a Western medical perspective, this doesn't quite line up. We know that testosterone levels will increase and peak at about two weeks, and after that, stress hormones begin to rise. The traditional way is to relax the stress hormones down and turn the essence into qi. Now, this is likely done through using testosterone as a precursor for hydrogen sulfide, 
and hydrogen sulfide is a gaseous neurotransmitter which has an uncanny correlation to kidney qi or yuan qi. When it's blocked in mice, they live a third as long. And this is because the clotho gene doesn't become expressed. It depends on hydrogen sulfide for its gene expression. So to live 33% longer seems to depend very much on this kidney qi, which is very correlated with hydrogen sulfide. So understanding how to use sexual energy is important in martial arts and meditation traditions. And all of this is traced back to Peng Zhu. It was said that he had a method of taking yang qi from yin to develop incredible internal power through sexual practices. Now, this is something that I heard when I was 11 or 12 from my stepdad, was that in ancient times, people like Peng Zhu and the Yellow Emperor could, instead of losing energy during sexual activity for men, they would actually utilize the yin qi, turn it into yang, and then be cycling it. And this is something that if you've picked up, uh, you know, any kind of esoteric sexual book about uh, tantric yoga or tantric sexuality and Taoist sexuality, you've probably seen. I mean, this stuff has been hitting U.S. bookstores since the 70s. However, there was a good reason why Peng Zhu really didn't like teaching it. He said that if impulsive and selfish people come to know the secret guidelines, they will indulge in pleasure, prey upon each other using it, and not use it to return to the source. And this is why we say to practice abstinence and that taking a thousand packages of herbs is not as good as taking a sexual break. Now, this isn't complete abstinence, but, you know, sometimes give it a rest. It's said that the five colors make people blind. The flavors injure the mouth. So, you know, from time to time, settle down a bit, especially in winter. Take your time. It's all water and fire. And Peng Zhu didn't teach people very much about this because you can use fire and water to boil soup, or you can use it to destroy something. You can burn down the house and drown a baby if you don't use fire and water properly. So if you can use it to regulate life, it's strong enough for that. You can certainly use it to become ill. So today in every coffee shop in America, I'm pretty sure, you know, let's say there's a 20% chance I can just go there and see some flyer up for a Kundalini yoga. So I just want to show the difference between kundalini yoga in the tibetan foothills versus kundalini practices in the united states i have a friend who's a taoist master on Qingcheng mountain he's the head of his taoist sect and if you've ever tried to teach family you know why his wife isn't his disciple but his wife is the disciple of a master of tantric buddhism and she follows this Tibetan master. A big part of her practice is kundalini tantric sexuality. However, for the first five years, her practice had nothing to do with sex at all. It was renovating her heart, her nature, so that changes in life between good luck and bad didn't affect her and she was able to stay peaceful during this time. And during this time, she was supposed to stay peaceful and within the context of her marriage, make sure that she wasn't adding stress for her husband. That was her homework. For the next five years, it was to take the harmony of their household outward into their communities. So if people, you know, needed to borrow sugar, I'm just, you know, an example She's over there helping when people are sick. She's cooking meals for them. If people had quarrels, she would help to harmonize and settle those. So community self-development, then community development, both happened first. Then the next level, for the next three to five years, when people had businesses, she would help them to attain harmony so that they were able to thrive without engaging in predatory behavior. After these 15 years, which for her actually ended up being more like 18. It was only after this that she started to practice the tantric sexual practices. 
it's not that she was a slow student. It's that we're taking it out of its cultural context in the United States and the West. And we're taking something that is designed to create internal harmony and harmony in the culture at large and turning it into something that I clinically have seen really screw people up and make them insane. And I believe that it's doing damage as well to communities as a whole. Now, the harmonization between the individual and the group is what I consider to be the essence of culture itself. And when we think of biohacking, self-cultivation, healing diseases, we should return to the teachings of Pengzu and the Yellow Emperor. Because ultimately, it is the regulation of what we already have that will provide us with the biggest advantages. Oh, it's not the 10,000 supplements or the herbs or the sexual techniques. It's culture. It's harmony. The regulation of the heart and mind seem to be the most valuable out of these for regulating health and disease. And Peng Zhu's advice on taking everything easy and transcending is also a medicine like Kundalini practice that we don't want to take without context. With a Chinese or Indian person practicing these arts, they're doing it within a context of a very integrated society. So going off and being a hermit is kind of balancing this out. So Chinese or Indian talks about transformation and personal journey. It's not the same thing as when a modern Westerner talks about a personal journey. Chinese society is so interconnected and yet individuals have much less personal choice. But there's tremendous love and connection and warmth built into the manners of the culture. There's also much further reaching social obligation and tribal ties to one's extended clan at pretty much everywhere in the world compared to the United States and uh, modern Western countries. The harmonious etiquette that's traditionally found in every culture is designed to constantly reaffirm to the subconscious that others in the group are safe and loved. For Western people who have grown up with a degree of individualism and social isolation that really hasn't been seen in our world before, and it's to such an extent that a large percentage of the population suffers from anxiety and depression. If we then take this as our foundation and further close ourselves off, it's not the medicine that we need, but a poison. Ultimately, Peng Zhu's goal was to balance the yang warmth of group harmony with the harmony of the individual. For Chinese society, that means more of a push to the personal. For Western society, I would say that there needs to be more attention on community cultivation, which is an important part of our health. You're more likely to spend time alone and to not know your neighbors or be mutually invested in anyone you know than anyone else at any time in our history as human beings. The lives of modern Western people are luxurious and strange, and our body doesn't physically understand what it's like not to eat every meal with 8 to 30 of our closest relatives. Now we have the curious and unnatural choice of eating alone. In spite of this choice, we still need to, at times, choose to be around people because the reality of life is that you're either lonely or annoyed. And it's good to be lonely, to learn to be content in that solitude. And it's great for us to be surrounded by people so that we are so annoyed and then from that, we can further soften ourselves and cultivate our inner nature. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to begin your day with some inner cultivation practices. And then in the afternoon, invite someone to an outing. Connect people who can do business together and start introducing people in ways that really brings out the best in them. Highlight people's positive aspects the aspects you really respect and find to be the most wonderful, and those aspects will grow. It will quickly begin to cultivate healthy community. And this is one of the best ways to increase your personal health. And of course, balance this and increase your personal reservoirs so you can be around people without getting tired or annoyed. Meditate on nothingness, practice shutting off. These are good things too. You can do this just by staring into space and zoning out. Then go from there and close your eyes and enjoy the feeling of complete nothingness. Balance community cultivation with internal cultivation 
and you are certain to have a more beautiful life. Thank you so much for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Miles.